Okay, guys, how's it going? You can hear me? I just want to make sure before I start. Good? Okay. Good. Okay. So listen, tonight's lesson is very important. Um, it's chaval that some of the people who were here yesterday are not here yet because there's a lot of clarity that needs to be gained about last night's class. The benefit of yesterday was you learned something new that was beautiful, that's true. Okay. However, when you learn something that's very deep, when you learn something that is different than what you normally do, you can often become overwhelmed. Yeah? Anybody feel overwhelmed yesterday? Anybody? I know some people feel let up, but some people were thinking about all the music and like, what am I going to listen to now? Yeah, I don't know how to bring this into my life, but music makes me happy. Okay. This Torah is going to bring us to a point that there's a tikkun. That even if you do listen to music that is not coming from that place that we said we should be actively looking for, you're protected from. Good? Does that make sense? That doesn't mean you should be actively looking for the music that we said not to try and listen to last night. But what it means is if you happen to hear it, Rabbi Nachman says if you do the thing that he's going to say later in the Torah, you are protected from the negative influence of that music. Does that make sense? Everybody just nod your heads. Yeah? Okay, good. So don't be overwhelmed. When you learn Rabbi Nachman's Torahs, they are masterpieces. They are like stories. They are like movies. If you stop in the beginning and you try and now like, okay, but yeah, so you're not going to understand yet. You can't understand even just by getting to the middle of it. You have to go from the beginning until the end. It's like the Torah. This is the reason why Rabbi Nachman says people are busy yeah, but let me get this sentence down right. And let me make sure I get it like this. And let me make sure I got it glot. And like, I understand it great. And like, this is perfect. And you're on that sentence for the rest of your life. <laughs> there's a whole Torah. There's Midrashim. There's the Zohar. There's, there's the Chumash. There's Tanakh. There's Tilim. There's... Okay. What does Rabbi Nachman say to do when you learn? Cover ground. Just learn. Don't think about how you're going to learn. Don't try to figure out what, just learn, 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 learn. And how, how should you be learning? Just learn whatever you're learning and then move on to the next thing. And then move on to the next thing. Okay. That doesn't mean that there's not also a place for slower also understanding in it. Okay. There is a place for that if you have time for that. But the issue is that Rabbi Nachman teaches from a pasuk from Mishle, which we actually say on Shabbat, Friday night, which we're going to speak about Shabbat tonight, Bezot Hashem. On Shabbat, we say the Eshet Chayl, this beautiful, strong woman, that she's... She goes and it's rich in one area and poor in another area. She goes afar to bring bread. Okay? You guys know what I'm talking about? When you say Eishet Chayel, she goes afar to bring bread home. She's a strong woman, meaning she does whatever it takes for the home to be happy on Shabbat. It's simple. It's the, it's the Jewish woman. Deeper than that, the whole Eishet Chayel is speaking about the Torah. Okay? The whole Eishet Chayel is applying to the Torah itself. She goes far to bring bread. So Rabbi Nachman says, what does that mean in terms of the Torah? It means that what you don't understand here, the answer to that is somewhere else in the Torah. And if you never go through the Torah because you're busy trying to figure out every single thing while you're doing it, not only will you not actually have clarity in it, but you will never learn anything else because you're stuck trying to figure out this thing. It's like life. Rabbi Nachman says, don't stop and contemplate every single thing that's happening in your life. Stop doing that. Whatever you're doing right now, 
do it to the best of your ability. And then when the next moment comes, do that again. And when the next moment comes, do that again. What happens though, let's say for instance, you have a difficulty, you have a challenge in your life, something like every single one of us. And we sit there and we're meditating on it. Uh, yeah, but what does this mean for me? And what's gonna happen? And how does this, but how does this play into my life? And then what about my plan? What about my 10 year plan? What about my five year plan? What about my three year plan? What about my one year plan? But what about a month from now? What about a week from now? What about a day from now? Your life is called the Torah. Whatever is related to the Torah is your life. You know, if there's one letter missing in the Torah, the whole Torah is pasul. It means it's not kosher, you can't use it. Why? It's one letter, who cares? You might not even get to that part. Because if you don't get to that part and see that part, you can't understand where you're at right now. Does everybody understand that? It is united, it's a whole. On Purim, when you are reading the Megillah, if you do not read from the beginning into the end in one shot, without stopping, so to speak, you're not rewarded with the mitzvah of reading the Megillah. If you did it a thousand times and you stopped a three-fourths or half of the way, one-fourth in, you do not get the mitzvah of reading the Megillah. You have to read it the whole way through. Why? Because the Megillah, like the Torah, like your life, doesn't make sense until you get from the beginning until the end. Does everybody understand that? And if you sit in the beginning of the Megillah and you're contemplating, but why would Hashem do this to the Jews? Why are they suffering so much? Why would these people go to a non-Jewish banquet and eat this non-kosher food? Why is it that nobody's listening to Mordechai? Why is it that Esther is not listening to Mordechai? Why is it that it looks like all the Jewish people are going to get exterminated? Why is it that Haman? And why is it that this? And why, and why is Hashem's name not mentioned at all? And if the mitzvah did not force you to read from the beginning until the end, you would stay in every single one of those places and sit there and contemplate how in the world could Hashem do this to us? How in the world am I in this place right now? Why is this happening right now? But you can't understand because you have to get to the end of the Megillah. And the Torah is the same way. When you're learning Torah, you read. And if you don't understand now, guess what Rabbi Nachman says? If you just keep going, you're going to see something later that's going to give you the answer to that. Because it's rich in one area and poor in another. Hashem made the Torah purposely that you have to get through the whole thing to understand truly any of it. But then how are you going to learn the whole thing? That's crazy. I work. I have a family. I have kids. I have to support them. X, Y, and Z. The answer is you don't sit down and try and with every single word and sentence. You just keep going. Like life. You just keep moving. How many of you have had a challenge in your life? in the past five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20, 25, 30, 35 years, 40, however old you are, that at the time felt like your life was gonna end. And then one week later, it wasn't like that anymore. And then one day later, it wasn't like that anymore. Do you know why? Because your life is rich in one area and poor in another. Because the days of your life, like the letters in the Torah, you need to get through them to understand any of it. And if you stick and you stay in one space and you're contemplating, what does this mean for me? How does this fit in? What am I going to do with this? Yes, yeah, so you can stay in that space. 
for a day, for a week, for a month, for years, for your whole life. And that's very scary. You could stay in that space for your whole life because you just didn't go through the whole Torah. You're not getting through your life. You're staying on each piece. And what's the reason? Because we do not trust Hashem. That's it. That's the only reason. We don't trust Hashem. That's it. There's nothing wrong with you because you don't trust Hashem. You're normal. We all don't trust Hashem. But that doesn't mean he's not trustworthy. That doesn't mean you can't trust him with all of your soul, with all of your heart, with all of your might, that every single thing he's doing for you is for the very best, for your good, to bring you closer to him in a way that you can't possibly fathom or imagine. It just means that you don't trust him. And that's okay. But that doesn't mean you should stop living because you don't trust him. It means you should go to Hashem in the field, in the forest, by a river, and say, Hashem, I don't trust you. But I want to. Let's say you don't really want to. Let's say you don't believe what I'm saying. Let's say you don't really think you can trust Hashem. That's also fine. It's okay. So what would you do? You go to the field, you go to the forest, you go to a river and you scream to Hashem, I don't trust you. I don't even want to. But I want to want to trust you. Does everybody understand? You have to say the truth that's in your heart, wherever you are holding, because that truth is the light. That truth is God himself. And if you're afraid to say the truth, you won't find Hashem, because Hashem is the truth. Oh, but I don't want to say because I don't want to. I don't want Hashem to get mad at me, and I don't want to hurt his feelings. What do you think Hashem is like a four-year-old kid? You have to put his diapers on him, make sure the uh, the baby the baby powder is all good. Hashem created the whole universe and everything in it. There is one physical universe. There is not millions of, 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 of spiritual ver uh, universes. There is not trillions of sp spiritual universes. There is an unlimited amount of spiritual universes. If you just look at the physical world and the galaxy and everything, if you really contemplate it, how small we are, how gigantic the universe really is, all of that, and that's with our limited perception of even what it is, is a physical universe. That is the lowest level of reality. Above that, there is a spiritual world. Above that, there is another spiritual world. Each one is infinitely bigger than this physical world. Up and up and up and up and up, and it doesn't end. Hashem, but I don't want to like say something that hurts you. I'm scared. Stop being scared. You know why nobody feels that Hashem loves them? Because we're scared to tell Him the truth. And then we blame Him. Why are you doing this to me? Why are you hurting me? Why are you this? You know why you're saying that? Because you're not telling Him the truth. Tell Him the truth. I don't trust you. But I want to. That's a beautiful prayer. That prayer is going to get answered. Do you know why? Because it's true. And let's say you don't want to, but you want to want to. If that's true for you, that's a beautiful prayer. That prayer is going to get answered. But if you say, Hashem, I trust you, I believe in you, I know you can help me, but you don't, stop saying that. <laughs> it's not true. 
And Hashem can't answer the prayer because the words that are coming out of your mouth are not true. Hashem is the truth. I'm struggling right now. My wife is sick. My kids are sick, chas v'shalom. I can't support my family. The economy is a mess. There's this COVID virus. Nobody even knows if it's real, if it's fake, if the government made it up, if it's like a real thing and it's literally the worst thing that's happened in our church. Nobody knows. So go to a sham and say, I have no idea what's going on right now. And I know somewhere inside of me that you are real. I know that somewhere. And I know that when I hear Rebbe Nachman give over Torah, I believe in you. I trust in you. But then I go out to my life and I lose it. And I don't feel it. I don't feel that joy. I don't feel that connection. I don't feel that warmth. I don't feel that happiness. I feel confused. I feel angry. I feel sad. I feel overwhelmed. But Hashem, I want to believe in you. I want to trust you. This is called holy chutzpah. If you don't have this, Rabbi Nachman says, you will never achieve Kedusha in your life. You will never have Kedusha in your life. Do you hear what I'm saying? Hashem loves when you say the truth to Him. He loves it. Imagine you're a dad and you have a kid. You love him with an infinite love. Let's say you're not a parent yet, but you, Bezrat Hashem, one day you will be. Or let's say you don't, even, you don't even know if you could love your kid. Maybe you weren't loved and you don't even know what that looks like. But imagine if you could love your kid with every ounce of your being in a way that's indescribable. All you think about is your child. Every single moment. Oh man, I wish this would happen with him and like, I really hope he can do this. And I, like, he's so talented and he's so smart and he's so beautiful, he's so special. You know, I, I, I don't want to impose on his life because I want him to, to, to be able to choose good for himself so that he can come out and be like, wow, I did this. But at the same time, I don't want him to completely lose track of reality. Hashem loves you like that, not times a million, not times a trillion, unlimited, unlimited. Now imagine your kid comes up to you and says to you, he's doing this, he's doing that. He goes, Abba, you know, I'm blazing, you know, I'm wasting seed. I'm doing this, I'm doing that. You know, the truth is, if I could be honest with you, I like doing those things. They give me, they make me feel temporarily good. But I know that long-term this isn't good for me. And I really want to stop doing this, but I don't know how. I don't know how I'm gonna fill that part of my life. There's something it's doing for me, otherwise I wouldn't be doing it. So help me to have something else that I can do that fills in instead. That's good, that's gonna bring me closer to you. That's gonna bring me closer to the person I really wanna be. What do you think that dad's gonna say? No, and he's gonna slap you in the face? Take you to the back and whip you with a belt? What kind of God do you think that we have? We're not Christian. We're not Catholic. Hashem is good. Hashem is good. Please, I'm begging you. I know you grew up listening to rabbis who tell you, you're going to Gehenna if you do this. You're going to get whipped with belts and, and, and shackles and, and they're going to tear your flesh. Oh my gosh, please, I beg you. I beg you, I beg you. Stop listening to those people. Please. Please. I'm not saying who they are. I'm never going to say who they are. It doesn't make a difference. For your own sake, please, for the love of God, stop listening to them. 
because it's cutting you off from everything you want in your life. The majority of my students who grew up in this area, who are Sephardic, who are Bukharian, are the nicest, sweetest people, smart, intelligent, funny, talented, everything. And they are so scared of God. <laughs> what if I do this? And what if I do that? And, what? and they do it anyway, but they feel terrible about it. Oh my God. This is... Stop. Just stop. Please. Everything's fine. <laughs> Everything is fine. Okay. It's good. Sababa. Everything is go okay, okay? Shem loves you. Shem loves you. Please stop listening to them. If you really want to be close to Hashem, please stop listening to those people. It doesn't mean they're bad people. They could be amazing people who are saying that. It doesn't mean they don't believe that it's true what they're saying. They probably do. But that doesn't mean you have to go to that place of darkness. It's darkness. That's not Judaism. I can bring you a thousand Christians who feel the same way. They feel bad about everything they do. And because they feel bad about everything that they do, they never actually grow closer to who they want to be because they're terrified. But because they're terrified, they can't grow because they're scared to grow. You are a Jew. Hashem loves you in a way that you can't possibly imagine. I'm going to tell you a million times. I used to watch wrestling. I'll take a chair and smack you over the head with it. I don't care. I, I can't take it anymore. I can't watch people here suffer for no reason. You want to be close to Hashem? You want to feel that Hashem loves you? You want to feel that Hashem cares about you? Stop listening to people who tell you he wants to hurt you. Stop listening to people who say he's going to punish you in the worst way and you're going to get flung from one end of the world to the other and then you're going to be on, on flames in a river. Stop. Stop listening to that. Please. <laughs> I don't know. I don't even know if the people here are listening to that, but I'm just saying you have to stop. Otherwise, don't blame Hashem that you don't feel that he loves you. Because Rabbi Nachman says, when you listen to that, it's impossible for you to experience Hashem truly as he is. Because you're clouding it with lies. When the Jewish people went to Har Sinai, there was three days before they went to receive the Torah. What were they doing for three days? Rabbi Nachman says, that Moshe was stripping them of all of their secular wisdom. What does that mean? Lies. For three days, he was telling them, stop with all of this nonsense. That's not Hashem. Whatever you think is going on is not what's going on. Whatever you were taught from your family, from your friends, from your community, from your rabbis, from all of this, you're not going to be able to receive the Torah if you believe that. So you need to stop listening for three days. When you get to Har Sinai, then, you won't have preconceived notions about who Hashem is. You'll be empty of all lies. Oh. And then we could be like one man with one heart. We could be connected in love and unity. And we can see like the Zohar says that when Hashem came down on the mountain, on Har Sinai, and there's never been a greater revelation of God in this world for all of history than Har Sinai. He was like a loving grandfather that came down and was all love. The Zohar says this. Oh, you didn't hear about that Zohar. You heard about the Zohar, about the Kafakela and getting flung from one end of the world to the other. So they're not giving you any context for what they're talking about. They're just saying really scary stuff. <laughs> There's context to these things.
There's different levels of revelation. The highest revelation is Har Sinai. Hashem didn't appear at Har Sinai like a red man with a tail with a spike in his hand. He didn't even appear like he did at the Yamsuf, like a young warrior who was just wiping out all the bad in the world, like the Zohar says. At Har Sinai, which was the greatest revelation, meaning the Jewish people had achieved the highest consciousness, the closest thing to the truth that we had ever experienced. What did they, what, is Hashem changing? No. It's not that he's the young warrior here. It's not that he's the old grandfather here. It's not that he's this here. It's that you're changing and you're experiencing him differently now. When you're coming out of Mitzrayim, when you're busy with the secular world and Hashem rips you out of there, you're like, oh my gosh, Hashem just like, whoop, you know, he just, and he looks like a young warrior. But then you find Rabbi Nachman of Breslov. Oh, if you ever have the schut. And then you go into a desert with him for 49 days. Connected your life. And every day you're listening to Moshe and you're trying to come closer to Moshe, what Moshe is telling you. And you're struggling with it. Why did you bring me to this world? Why did you bring me to a spiritual world? I was happy in the secular world. I had what I needed there. I had it food and drinks and money and girls. And that. No, you didn't. Your life sucked. <laughs> you hated your life. That's why you're in the desert now. Oh, no, but it can't be as bad as this. this. No, this is much better. You just can't see that because you're not doing that now anymore. You hated that. That's why you're in the desert now. You're looking for something different. You're just struggling. And you come to Moshe, I'm like, yeah, but this, but this, but this, but this. But now if you're in the desert with Moshe, if you're in the desert with Rebbe Nachman for 49 days and every day you're doing your best, to see it from Hashem's perspective, not from your negative influences from your family, from your community, from your society, from your version of Torah that you got from your rabbis. That's what the desert was. It was all leaving them for 49 days. And on the 50th day, they saw Hashem the closest to how we could possibly perceive him in this world. And that was as a loving grandfather who loves you with unconditional love. Not like you're hearing in all of these classes. Did Hashem just become a loving grandfather? No, we grew. We became more um, wise. We became stronger. We became more resourceful. We connected to each other more. We became more united. And then at the, at the time, after 49 days, that we realized that it's okay that I don't have the answers. It's okay that I don't know what's going on in my life. But I have a whole group of brothers who are like that also. We all have no idea. <laughs> we don't know. It's okay. Let's not know together. Let's not know together. And then they got the greatest revelation of godliness that has ever been experienced in history. And we didn't perceive him from our inner turmoil, from our inner chaos, from our inner darkness. We saw Hashem as close to as truly he is as we've ever seen. Only love. I didn't prepare to talk about this tonight. <laughs> but I just can't do this anymore. I can't take it anymore. I'm getting texts and calls from people from last night's class who are scared out of their mind to grow. They're scared out of their mind to stay as they are. They're scared out of their mind to go back. They're just scared. Why? Because you believe that Hashem is out to get you. Chas v'shalom. Please listen to me. Please hear me. 
if I'll try to make it very easy for you, for any of you who know me, okay? However much you think that I love you, that I care about you, that you believe that when you hear me, where do you think I get that from? I have to get it from Hashem. But my love is just a little love. I mean, it's just one person. I'm one person and I'm doing the best that I can and I'm trying as best as I can, but that's just... Imagine if that love was infinite. Somebody asked me, he's actually a rabbi in this community who I respect a lot, who has helped thousands of people in this community. I'm not gonna say who he is. It's really mom is one, one of the greatest people I ever met. And in a moment of complete honesty, he came up to me privately and he asked me, how do I know that Hashem loves me? How do I know that Hashem loves me? So I said to him, do you love Jews? He said, yeah, Vadai, of course. I said, how much do you love Jews? There's no way to explain how much I love Jews. I said, do you sacrifice every day and night everything in your life for the Jewish people? He said, yeah, that's all I ever think about. I said, where do you think you got that from? Who do you think planted that inside of you? You love like that because Hashem loves like that. And that version is only a small version of how much he loves you. So from now on, when you're learning with me, stop being scared. Throw it away. Take a trash bin, take all of your fears, throw them in the trash bin, light it up. We'll make kosher marshmallows over there. And we'll have like, you know, six feet spacing, whatever is the regulations. But please light that thing on fire and forget about it. It is not real. And it's causing everyone here not to be able to grow. When Rabbi Nachman teaches you something, it doesn't mean you should now go home and shake in your pants and think to yourself, how am I going to do this? What if I'm not doing this? So now that I know about this, but if I'm listening to this music, so now, but that, that, that's bad, that's going to harm me. And now, oh, but if I try to, yeah, but, I'm, uh, but I don't like it. And then I'm, doing, so I'm going to feel bad doing it. I'm going to feel bad doing it. And stop. Stop. Rabbi Nachman says, we're people, we're not angels. We're people, we're humans. He didn't want to make us like angels. If he wanted to make us like angels, he would have made us angels. He made us people. You're a human being. We make mistakes all the time. It's fine. <laughs> Doesn't mean you should go try and do it, but if you do it, okay. Jim, I want to do better. I want to come closer to you. I want to connect more. You know, like I, I was really struggling and I, I, but you're sitting home and you're thinking about it and you can't sleep and like, I don't know what to do and I'm not stop with all of that. Okay. Sorry. This is just been, this is just um, this has just been on my mind for a long time, and and now that these classes are thank God becoming bigger and um, reaching more people, uh, and I guess maybe for people who are listening, it's taking on like a greater proportion. You're gonna have to know now. There's what Hashem until the end with me. Stop being scared. If you find yourself being scared, I want you to say out loud, Sheker, you're alive. If you see you're scared, say sheker, you're alive. The fear that you think is fear of Hashem, that's not fear of Hashem. That's called anxiety. Yerat Hashem is not anxiety. The Zohar says that you, where is the place of shalom, peace? The place of Yerat. 
That means that if you actually really feared Hashem, you would fear, feel complete inner tranquility. So obviously the fear that we're all talking about is not the fear that the Zohar and the Torah is talking about. Because that fear, whatever that is, I don't know what that is, but whatever that feeling is, that experience is, that needs to, to have in it complete inner peace. If you don't feel complete inner peace when you have fear of Hashem, you don't have fear of Hashem. You have fear of people, places, and things, and you're projecting all of that garbage onto Hashem. And it's stopping you from growing. It's stopping you from becoming who you can be. You each can do so much in your life. You don't even know. Every single person that I speak to, every person that comes, the nicest, smartest, most capable people, and stuck, stuck for no reason. Because I heard from this rabbi that the world is going to end tomorrow. If I don't uh, stop wasting seed and, uh, and if Mashiach comes by that point, and then I'm going to be a stop. You really think Hashem is going to come and wipe out the whole world? <laughs> you think that that's the God of Judaism? You think Hashem is going to come? and wipe out 80% of his children. Can you imagine if you had 100 children? Can you imagine you had 100 children? Let's say you had 10 children. Imagine you had 10 children, and you were a normal father. Many of us don't know what that is, but you had a normal father who loved you, and he was like somewhat responsible, and, and okay. You imagine him that because they didn't like go in the way that he, 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 he wanted them to and he hoped would, so now he's going to take a knife and just cut eight of their heads off? Does that make sense to you? Rabbi Nachman of Breslov says, Gog of Magog is not even a physical war. You hear? It's not even a physical war. It's kafira. It's lack of amuna versus amuna. That's the war. Gog and Magog is the people who want to believe and are trying to believe in the truth of truths, in the Shem, Hashem, the one that loves you, the one that wants to connect to you, that wants to do good to you, and the rest of the world who says not like that. That's Gog and Magog. And you know what's going to get wiped out? All of the nonsense, all of the garbage, all of the lies that you're being constantly told. Whoop. It's all going to go away. But the Goga Magog sounds so violent. It sounds so hard. It sounds so difficult. Yeah, you're living in it right now. You know why you're so confused? Goga Magog. Do you know why you're anxious? Goga Magog. Do you know why you're sad? Goga Magog. This is it. Rabbi Nachman said in 1800, 1810, that you don't know this, but kafir is going to spread all over the world. What's kafir? Atheism. And you think that just means people are going to stop believing in God. It doesn't just mean that. They're not going to believe in God as he really is. They're going to have made up gods. That's also kafira. That's also lack of belief. If you don't believe that Hashem loves you, is doing everything for your very best, is doing everything in your life only to bring you closer to you, that's kafira. That's called atheism. It's not about believing in a God. It's about believing in God. That struggle you're having in your life, that emotional struggle, that psychological struggle, that physical struggle, that's the war that's going on between you and your heart, between Kafira and Amuna. That's Gogu Magog. And that part of you 
that doesn't believe that is going to get wiped out. Baruch Hashem, it's great. Why should you be scared about that? Oh, you're going to say, well, what about a Mitzrayim? Four-fifths of them got wiped out. I'll tell you a deep secret. You ready? You have five levels of your soul. They're called Nefesh, Ruach, Neshama, Chaya, Yechida. Five levels of your soul. Three of them you're capable of consciously connecting to in this physical world. Two levels of your soul you can't consciously connect to while we are in this physical world as it currently is. They exist. They're actually influencing the part of you that does consciously experience God. But you can't consciously connect to it. What does it mean that four-fifths got wiped out? It means that you had discarded the lower four levels of your soul and you were only left with the Keter, with the Yechida, with the highest level of yourself, the highest version of yourself. That all of the Jewish people had attained the level of the Keter of their soul and they were all one together, united. Four fifths got left behind. Do you understand that? Do you understand what I'm saying or no? Tell me if you don't. No, again. Okay, listen. You have five levels of your soul. So there's one-fifth of your soul. There's two-fifths of your soul. There's three-fifths of your soul. There's four-fifths of your soul. There's five-fifths of your soul. Everybody good so far? Okay. When you elevate to a higher level of your soul... So the lower level, so to speak, becomes nullified because you reach the higher level. So that part of you that you're with, you don't experience that now. It becomes nullified. It becomes extinct. Does that make sense? Now, let's say you got up to the highest level of your soul, to the top fifth. What happens to the four fifths below? Be tool, they get nullified. So what does that leave you with? One fifth left. How many people made it out of Mitzrayim? One fifth. How many died in the desert? Four fifths. Does everybody understand this so that I just taught you? All that left Mitzrayim, all that left the desert was the best version of yourself. The rest was killed. Is that the scariest thing in the world? Is that the most horrifying, scariest thing in the world? That you become the best version of yourself and that all the Jewish people do? We do that individually, we do that collectively, and we leave this world as the highest versions of ourselves. That's the scariest thing in the world. Okay, so because it's 10 o'clock now, I'm not going to do the piece in the Kutumaran that I intended to, but this was very important. For anyone who is listening to this class on Zoom or online or will on YouTube or whatever, if you want to come to these classes and you want to hear Rabbi Nachman's Torah and you want it to be a Torah of life and not a Torah of death, Please understand that Hashem loves you. Hashem wants the best for you. Hashem only wants to bring you closer to Him. That's all He ever does, wants, feels. If you can take that with you into the class and then hear what Rabbi Nachman is saying, so come. But if you're going to come in here with all of the craziness that you're hearing outside, along with it, you're going to take Rebbe Nachman's Torah and you're going to bring it to a very dark place. Please don't do that. 
not for yourself and not for anybody else. Because Rabbi Nachman's Torah can bring you to redemption. But that means you're going to have to leave behind some parts of you. Not the real parts of you. All the garbage you've heard your whole life. Does anybody have any questions? Monday, Thursday night, we're going to have another class. We will, Bezat Hashem, actually move forward in the Torah. Okay? But please ask me questions on what I'm talking about right now because it's so important what we're saying. And, and you will not be, not just in life, you won't be a functional human being if you're always scared. With Hashem, you're never going to get close to Him if you're always scared. Because that thing that you think is Yerat Hashem, that is not Yerat Hashem. That's not what the Torah is speaking about. Yes. Go ahead. This is what Rabbi Nachman says. I'm not saying anything. So Rabbi Nachman says, so they said that there's going to be more Mashiach going to come. Yes. It's a spiritual war. No, he will physically come, but in the midst of this spiritual war of Kafira versus Amunah. Okay, one other question. And also, just to add, and one of the other perceptions, because David Amelech, who we know is the soul of Mashiach, David, he was a mighty warrior. Yeah? And we know that the soul of David is going to come back as the Mashiach. David's going to come back and he's the Mashiach. Okay? So it must be that whatever he was then, he's going to be now. And he was a warrior. Slicing and dicing. Okay? But... Rabbi Nachman says explicitly in the second Torah of Lakuta Maran, and it's brought down in the commentaries as well, that Mashiach will not have to lift one hand to bring redemption. He's going to do the whole thing through his mouth. But he's a warrior, and he's going to like kill people, and he's going to be like a soldier, and he's going to wipe everybody out. Who are we kidding? He's Jewish. He has a standard. He has a book. What are you talking about? He's teaching. He's learning. He's, he's like, he has a family. He has a wife. What are you talking about? <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> he's going to do the whole thing with his mouth through his prayer. His, his status as a warrior is going to be the fact that he is slicing and dicing kafir in the world. And that doesn't just mean, I, I don't believe in God. It means the God you believe in is not the real God. He's going to be slicing and dicing that as well. Because that's the greatest thing that's holding the Jewish people back from actually experiencing Hashem. It's not Hashem himself. It's lies. It's half-truths. It's three-fourths truths. It's four fourths. Whatever. I'm not doing. I'm not good at math. But whatever. It's not a complete truth. And as long as it's not completely true, it's not Hashem. And if it's not Hashem, then what are you believing in? It's kafira. You had another question on that. Uh, so the person's thinking and planning ahead. Is that? Um, what type of planning are we talking about? <laughs> um, uh, family, Israel, or So, so I'll tell you like this. If you want to do something now, let's say you go out of class, you're like, you know, I want to move to Israel. That's beautiful. Rabbi Nachman says every Jew should want to move to Israel. Oh my God. What do you mean? <laughs> yes, every Jew should want to move to Israel. Good? Okay, it's out in the open. It's all good. Okay. So now what do I do now? Okay, but I have a family and I have this. Okay, so what can help me right now that can help me move to Israel? Oh, you think looking up a job can help you? Okay, good, so look it up. And then let's say after that, you're like, you know, what else can help me move to Israel? And you do this. Okay, good. So you do it. But to be thinking and, 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 and uh, I have a five-year plan. I have a 10-year 
Yeah, you don't have a muna. Action. action. Even your plans need to be in action. Even your thinking needs to be in action. Does that make sense? Do you hear the difference? I know it's very subtle, but it, it, it's all, the only thing that exists is right now. That's it. You see, right? Listen to me. Right now, this exists. But that right now was, was one moment ago. So that doesn't exist anymore. Now this moment exists. Now that just passed again. It doesn't exist anymore. This is the only thing that exists. But what about the future? It doesn't exist. What about the past? It doesn't exist. The only thing that exists is right now and it already passed. Ani lo yodeya. It's the highest level. I don't know anything. <laughs> So what do you do? Rabbi Nachman says, every tzaddik that you ever learned from, listened to, you were encouraged by, you had chizik from, that you wanted to get closer to Hashem from, he says explicitly in Likuta Moran that every single one of them, the, the strand that connected all of them, what was it? Because there are a lot of them that are different. They, they have different teachings. They have different mannerisms. They, what is the one thing about all of them? that none of them ever thought about tomorrow. And none of them ever thought about yesterday. They only thought about right now. Do you hear what he's saying? That means that what differentiates them and us is not that they're smarter, not that they're more capable, not that they're more emotionally sound, not that they have better family lives, not that they have more finances, that the thing that made them the greatest tzaddikin that ever lived is that the only moment that exists is right now. Because they lived with that their whole life, they accomplished everything they accomplished. But that doesn't mean you can't look into it, but it means if you want to, just go do it. But do not sit around thinking because you're missing that moment of life. Now you lost that moment of life. You mean that thought comes first and then the action? Yes, but your thought, should, your, your thought needs to be in a mode of action. Everything is, is, is like, for instance, right now. I had a, like, I have this class right now, okay? This is a new organization, right? This is a brand new class. Um, we're, for the first time together at Sion together. Any normal person that left his job as a therapist, as a substance abuse counselor, and then joins a colo when he has kids and a wife, that doesn't make any sense. Yeah, that's not logical. Oh, Hashem, I didn't listen to anybody. Okay, thank God. Now, all of a sudden, I have an organization and I actually left my job, my, my measly paying job that I, we were barely making it. So I can potentially, possibly make even less, maybe. So everything on paper is writing on this organization working out for me, for my family, for everything. And it would have been very normal for me to spend the whole day not learning, not praying, not crying my heart out to Hashem for an hour in the field, not helping every single Jew in the best way that I possibly could. And just sat and thought about what's the best way to do this class. And you know what I would have missed? Everything. I would have missed everything. Do you hear the difference? This is, this is, this is something that over time is going to take. It's very subtle, okay? What we're speaking about is very subtle. And therefore, just be patient. Yes, yes. Go ahead. Yeah. It's very, it's very strong. It's very like it's, it's yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. So if you want to know the whole shots, for example, so you need to plan. You need to plan where you're going to sit and learn every day, how many pages, what's your, like, you need to plan. And that's not for today. That's like at least for an hour to or tomorrow. So, so how would you think tonight? And, and, and another place in my middle, most of the other places, you said, like you said, you said that you, you only have the now. That was the power of the way it was. So how do you how do you reconcile these two things? Things? Yeah, it's called reconcile. How do you rec how do you no 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 I'm saying it, whatever it's how do you reconcile these two realities? So anyone did it's like so so said that there's two showers like the real rabbi that's when you set up and so so the way to do it is to plan now for what you want to do. To do something now to plan it. Like we just said about Israel. You want to find out. You do something now to plan it. So I, I want to know the whole world, but I need to plan it now or tomorrow. I need to plan like so, No, so all you do is you say, you come up with a plan. Maybe a hippo to do it is a really good time to do that. What is a plan? That, that, so you didn't waste time, you spent time. Now in that hour, you figured out a plan for you. But you don't spend now every single day figuring out if that plan made sense, if that plan works, because you know what's going to happen? You're never going to do it. I said to myself two years ago, I want to learn Rashi from the beginning until the end of the year. Now on paper, that didn't make sense. Why? Because I don't, my, my, my kolo doesn't like give me time necessarily for that because we're learning Gemara and we're learning Halakha. Right, and then I have th three kids at home, and I have a wife who needs me, and I have all these things. Right? Okay, good. And at the same time, if Hashem wants you to be able to, you can do anything. So, I did like this. I said, Hashem, please, I want to learn Rashi this year in the Torah. I know my schedule doesn't really permit for me to be able to do that, but I know you want me to, and I want to. Help me to do that. So what did I do? I tried Chok Yisrael. But I didn't think more than that. I got a Chok Yisrael. I saw, you know what, maybe I can use this Chok Yisrael. It has the Rashis. But it goes according to the Arizal. Meaning, it was the way that the Arizal, the Sephardic one. It was the way that the Arizal used to learn um, Chumash. He'd do a few Pasukim here today. There's for Kabbalistic reasons why. And then on the sixth day, before you go to the Mikvah, you learn like the whole entire thing. Okay. So I realized the first time I tried this, I can't do this right now. I don't have the uh, psychological, emotional, physical, anything to be able to do that. That didn't work. So what did I do? I just quickly flipped. I'm like, you know what? What would be manageable for me? I think if I did one Ali a day, it's possible. And then in my hibo to do it the next day, I said, Hashem, help me to try to do one Ali a day. And that was it, but I didn't think more about it. And then I tried. And then somebody came up to me and he said, what are you learning? I said, I'm learning Chumash. He goes, really? It was in the Kola, one of the Kola guys. Because they're learning Halacha, they're learning Gemar, they're, you know. Oh, you're learning Chumash? What are you learning Chumash with? Oh, with Rashi. Really? I, he said, yeah, what are you doing? I said, oh, I'm trying to do like an Aliyah a day. I think maybe I'll be able to like finish the Torah portion every week that way and actually maybe be able to finish with Rashi this year. He goes, he goes oh, you're following the Vilna Gaon. I said, what are you talking about? He said, yeah, the Vilna Gaon, he, um, he also struggled to finish the Parsha every week. And he found that the best way for him to be able to do it was to learn one Aliyah a day. That was manageable for him. So I'm like, okay, that's, that's pretty good company. I mean, like he tried it. I'm not, I'm not the Vilna Gaon, I'm not anything, but I'm just, you know, at least. Why did I hear that? Because Hashem's telling me, you can do it. How, how did I get to hear that? because I trusted Hashem. I threw myself on Hashem completely. My planning was, Hashem, I think this is good, but what do I know? Hashem, help me to try it. And then it doesn't work out. Hashem, help me to try something different. You have to be honest with yourself. You have to be very honest with yourself. But Rabbi Nachman says, free will is very simple. This is how it works. If you want to, you will. If you don't want to, you won't. That's how free will works. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, it's very simple. People say all the time, people are asking Rabbi Nachman, you're saying this, you're saying that, I'm hearing from rabbis this, I'm hearing from rabbis that. How does free will work? He said free will is very simple. Listen to how free will works. It's real. There is free will. It's a, it's a yesod in the Torah, right? The Rambam says if you don't believe in free will, like you don't believe in the Torah. Okay, good. So you have free will. One second. One, wait, one second. One second. One, wait, 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 wait. One second. That was good, though. I like that you're excited. No, that's good. That's the mic I like, okay? You have free will. So now, that's good. Now, how does that work? Rabbi Nachman says it's very simple. You never have to think about it again the rest of your life. If you want to, you will. And if you don't want to, you won't. That's how free will works. Good. Yeah. And it means if you're not doing what you want to be doing, it means that you actually don't want that as much as you think you do yet. And you need to increase your will for it. How do you increase your will for it? By praying more for it. The more you pray for it, the more you're going to increase your will for that thing. You're saying to yourself, yeah, but I can't go to Israel right now. I can't go to Israel. I can't go to Israel right now. Why? You're going to say, because it's not practical, because it's not logical, because it's not this, because it's not that. The real truth is because you don't want to go. Be like, what are you talking about? I don't want to go to Israel. I don't want to go to Israel. Of course I want to go to Israel. Of course I want to go to Israel. So you know the reason why you're not there yet? It's because you don't want it enough yet. That's not a problem. That doesn't mean there's something wrong with you. It's fine. It's okay. But if you feel that you, that is for you, that you feel connected to that, that you would like to live there, so then know that the reason I'm not there yet is just because I don't want it enough yet. That's okay. Now, what do you do is you go to Hashem and you go to dude, you say to Hashem, Hashem, I want to want to be in the land of Israel. And if you're genuine about it, that's going to turn into, I want to be in the land of Israel. And then, Bezrat Hashem, one day you'll be in the land of Israel. There was a person who was crying hysterically to his rabbi. And one of Rabbi Nachman's students overheard the conversation. And he was crying to him and telling him, I want to go to the land of Israel. I want to go to the land. So one second, because this might sound like it's a contradiction to what we just said, but it's not. So let me just explain the whole thing. The rabbi said, he's listening to him. He's, he's telling him every day I'm crying to be in the land. Every day I'm crying to be in the land. He said, I don't understand. After he, said, he stopped him, he said, I don't understand. Go pack your bags and go to the land. So the student of Rabbi Nachman heard this conversation and he was disturbed by it he didn't know why he was disturbed he didn't know if it was because of this guy telling the story or because of the rabbi's response but just something wasn't right he didn't know what it was he came back to Rabbi Nachman and he told him the story Rabbi Nachman told him like this that guy who's crying every day to be in the land of Israel that person will live in the land of Israel that guy who said, just go pack your bags and leave, that guy's never going to step foot in the land. And you know what happened? Just that. That guy who was crying every day to be in the land ended up in the land of Israel. And that guy who said, well, why don't you just go? He didn't end up going. Because... To the degree that you want something good in your life, to that degree, you must want it for it to happen. How do you express your want? Through your prayer. The more you want something, the more you're going to pray for it. Why didn't Hashem give me this thing yet that I really want? Because you don't want it yet enough for the goodness of the thing that you want. Does that make sense? Like if, for instance, I want to be sitting and learning in Kolo all day. And I say to myself, you know what? I tried. I, I want to, and it's just not happening. So that's, that, that's fine. That's okay. That's totally fine. 
but know that to be sitting and learning all day and to be able to also do Ibota dude in the middle of the day and to be able to like get lunch for free is like Olam Haba in this world. I'm not saying this is for everybody. I'm just saying that like, if, you, if, that, if that's for you, if that, that type of thing is for you, if you like that type of stuff. So how much do you need to want that for that to happen? To the degree that it's good, that's how much you need to want. How do I express my want through my mouth? So it doesn't mean I should go into the kolel and just throw everything aside because I have a wife and I have kids. No, you need to increase your want for it. You keep doing what you're doing. You go with your job, you do this. And then when you go to the field, you cry harder to be in kolel. You cry harder to be able to learn more. You cry harder to be able to pray more. That way, it's the truth. You're holding at your truth but you're praying for a greater truth. That's just an example. I'm not saying everybody should be in Kolo. I don't believe that. Rabbi Nachman never said that. In fact, it's a big lie. If everybody says you should be learning all day, you don't have to be learning all day. If you're at work, there's amazing, amazing tikkunim that can only happen at work. Only happen at work, Rabbi Nachman said. There's a reason why you're at your job. Okay? I'm just giving an example. Any questions? Any other questions? Does everybody understand? I think there were some questions at the bottom. I'll just ask these and then sit the shim on. Question, if four fifths got wiped out and we were elevated to the light, highest level, how could the Jews end up complaining in the desert if we were on such an exalted level? Because to get there, you go through tremendous, tremendous emotional and inner turmoil. Because you are dying. Parts of yourself are dying. To, to, to die is very painful. But, 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 you're, but you, you're dying because, because you're, you're being reborn as a new self. That, so that part died. Like for instance, before Pesach, you know, anyone who knows me well, and like, you know, my good friends, like a lot of the people here, to some degree knows that I'm trying the best that I can. Whatever that means. I'm always trying the best that I can. That doesn't mean I'm succeeding in anything I'm doing, but I'm trying very hard. And I just felt like there's something holding me back. Something holding me back. For Pesach, I just like, there's this weight on me and I don't know what it is. It's this weight on me. And before I got to Pesach, I went to the field that day. And I poured my guts out to Hashem, screaming and crying. I want a new heart. I don't want kafira anymore. I don't want to believe in you a little bit. I don't want to believe in you a lot. I want to believe in you 100%. And you know why I don't? Because my heart is broken. So give me a new heart. Give me a new heart. And he did. Doesn't mean I'm good now. I'm going to need another new heart. But um, that part of me died before Pesach. That one-fifth got left behind. And thank God. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. Thank God. Thank God. Any question? Anything else? Okay. I love you guys. Thank you so much. Tomorrow night is the women's class. Please look, look, look at me right now. This shouldn't be like this. This should be full here, full there. When I was in Uma and there was kids hanging from the, um, from the chandeliers, they should be that also. Yeah, yeah, whatever it was. This place should be packed. I know, but I'm just, 
I'm telling you because you are the key. You are the key. I'm nothing. I'm nothing. You are the key. You feel anything that I'm feeling right now? If you feel anything that I'm feeling right now, get one other person. Please. Because there's so many people in their home right now suffering. Suffering. Not because anything is wrong. Because of lies. Because of half-truths. Because of three-fourths truths. Because of four-fourths truths. Again, the math wasn't right, but whatever it is, there's lies. So many lies. And even if they're not lies, they're not completely true. And if it's not completely true, you can be depressed, you could be anxious, you could be confused, you can have issues in your home, you can have every single problem in the world if you don't have the whole truth. Rabbi Nachman has the entire truth, the entire truth. But your ability to be able to experience that is to leave behind parts of yourself. How do you do that? By crying to Hashem. Hashem, please, something is holding me back from believing you completely. And if I'm going to be honest with myself, it's because I don't believe in you. I don't really believe in you completely. I need a new heart. Give me a new heart. Because with Hashem, Hashem should give you one. Thank you, guys.